Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, it is an honor and a pleasure for me to introduce our first keynote speaker of the afternoon, Ambassador, His Excellency, Ambassador Daniel Moho. Uh, I must say it's a distinct pleasure for me to introduce him for a number of reasons. First of all, given his current position as ambassador. Uh, secondly, given the fact that he's going to be presenting to us the Irish perspectives uh, on the issue of nation branding as well as also national identity. Uh, how are national identities presented abroad? How are they perceived abroad? Uh, and how does that sometimes not correlate with the reality within the country? The other reason why I'm quite happy to have him here is I'm also honored to be able to consider him a close friend and partner of the Institute. Uh, we've had a chance really to collaborate on a number of occasions uh, together with also some of his ministers also from Ireland. Uh, I'm also grateful to say on our advisory board we have a very prominent uh, Irish uh, member as well, uh, Mr. Bertie Ahern, former Prime Minister, uh, who as we all know is really uh, pivotal uh, in the whole peace process in Northern Ireland. So for many reasons I have a close uh, re relation to, to Ireland. And uh, I'm really much, very much looking forward to today's lecture. Uh, allow me to say a few words of background about His Excellency Ambassador Mulhall. He was born initially in Waterford, Ireland, in April 1955. Was educated at the University of College Cork and later Murdoch University in Western Australia, uh, where he has a very close affinity, uh, in particular through his wife. Uh, so uh, in that sense, uh, a frequent uh, traveler uh, also to Australia. He joined the Department of Foreign Affairs of Ireland in 1978 and since then has held positions in the department's economic, political, development cooperation, and press and information divisions. In 1994 until 1995, he was also a member of the Secretariat of Ireland's Forum for Peace and Reconciliation. He's had diplomatic postings in New Delhi, Vienna, Brussels, Edinburgh. Uh, in Edinburgh, he was the Consulate General uh, of Ireland and Scotland. Kuala Lumpur, uh, where he was Ireland's ambassador to Malaysia, Thailand, Laos, and Vietnam from 2001 until 2005. And when he was in Thailand, he actually had the chance to overlap also with uh, Dr. Subachai, I believe when he was the vice uh, prime minister uh, of um, Thailand. So actually a connection also with our, our previous speaker. Since August uh, 2005, uh, he then was serving as Director General uh, for the European Union and OECD Division, Department of Foreign Affairs in Dublin. And currently, as I said, he is serving as Ireland's Ambassador to Germany. So for many reasons, I'm really very much looking forward to your lecture, Ambassador Mulhall. And I would ask you to please join me in a very, very sincere welcome for His Excellency, Ambassador Daniel Mulhall. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Oops. Already, I've, I've, I've mucked things up, but anyway, hang on a minute, maybe I can do this myself, otherwise I'll have to get some... Uh... Oh, gosh. I think maybe... microphone. Okay, that's good. So, uh, may I start again? <laughs> Thank you very much for the invitation. Always a pleasure to be here at the Institute as a representative of a small country. I have a particular interest in soft diplomacy and cultural diplomacy because a small country has no alternative but to be an exponent of soft power and cultural diplomacy. We don't have the option of hard power. In any case, I believe that there's plenty of evidence to suggest that hard power is not a particularly effective uh, way of wielding influence anyway. It, it, it certainly needs to be combined with uh, soft power in order to be effective. The second reason why I have an affinity with this institute is that I have a particular belief in the importance of cultural diplomacy. And I have that belief for two reasons. First of all, a general reason that my experience has been that cultural diplomacy is a very effective form of diplomacy. Wherever I've been in the world, I've always realized that if you organize an event on a cultural topic, you're much more likely to get a good an interesting audience for your activity than if you organize an event with a more formal political or economic theme. So my experience is that cultural diplomacy creates an interest that is the first step towards effective communication. There's no point in you getting up 
on a platform and talking to people about what you want to talk about. If you're going to interest your audience, you've got to talk about what they want to hear about. And it's much more likely that a cultural topic will appeal to an audience. That's the first reason why I'm an exponent of cultural diplomacy. The second reason is that it's a particular Irish thing that we happen to have for reasons of historical development, accident to some degree, we happen to have a strong cultural offering in Ireland. The reason we have that strong cultural offering is because Ireland is influenced by two cultural strands. The first is the Anglo-American English-speaking culture of which we are part as an English-speaking nation. And that reflects itself in the fact that Irish people are, are good, are, are prominent in literature and the English language. In rock music, for example, we have many uh, good Irish exponents of, of popular music because it's a music that is essentially driven through the English language. It gives an advantage to people with an English mother tongue background. That's the first strand. And the second strand is the Celtic, the traditional Celtic Irish cultural background. And that reflects itself today in things like river dance. Now, river dance is a kind of a Hollywood version of the traditional Irish dancing and music. But nonetheless, it has been possible to turn this traditional cultural uh, product into a global sensation. But every day in Ireland, um, people play traditional music, not just for tourists, but they do it for their own benefit, for their own entertainment. In other words, our, tradition, our, our traditional culture, our traditional music, is not something we, we dress up in funny outfits and play for tourists. We do it for ourselves. So any day of the week in Ireland, in any town, any village around the country, you can find a pub where there'll be local musicians who just gather together and they will play traditional music using fiddles and, and accordions and guitars and anything you can imagine, but playing traditional music, uh, which goes back to centuries into the past. Um, so it's a genuine part of our cultural heritage and it's still living today. And there are very few countries in the world where, where traditional culture uh, survives side by side with a vibrant popular culture. So in Ireland you can find, as I said, in any one street, in any town in Ireland, you can find in one pub traditional music being played. In the next pub you will find very good rock music played. So we have both traditions and that I think makes our culture more interesting from the point of view of outsiders who are viewing Ireland. So cultural diplomacy is important because we're a small country, because I have experience myself how important it is to use culture as a, a signature for our country. In other words, our, our cultural offering gives our country a distinctive appeal, a distinctive brand in the international arena. Now, what I want to say, talk about today is who are we? Who do we think we are? And who do others think we are? So these are the questions that every country in the world has to answer these questions. Now, I can only answer them for Ireland, but you can answer them for your own countries because these questions will be equally relevant to your individual countries. Now, then there's the issue of, in the world in which we live in today, Let's just call it globalization. I know it's a, it's a hackneyed old word, but it probably is as good as any word to describe what, uh, what I mean. And let me just give you an anecdote. When I went to India in 1980 as a young diplomat, is there any, anybody from India here? No. Anyway, when I went to India in 1980 as a diplomat, before most of you were born, When I went to India, I flew eight hours from, 
from Frankfurt, in fact, as it was. I flew from Dublin to Frankfurt and Frankfurt to New Delhi on Lufthansa. And when I arrived in India, I arrived in a, a different world because I, I couldn't pick up the telephone and ring my family back in Ireland. Because in those days, you had to book a call, and it took days. And when you finally made the connection with Ireland, the line was so bad that you couldn't hear anything. So in the end, you didn't bother. So for three years in India, I never spoke to my family in Ireland, not once. Right? When my daughter was born in 1982, I had to send my family a telegram to tell them that they had a, a granddaughter. Right? Now, today, if I was on posting in Delhi today, I would have my internet radio. I would listen to Irish radio every day. I would be totally in contact with home. I would go onto the internet and I would watch Irish television. I'd watch the news program every evening. I would be totally linked. I would have my mobile phone. I could ring my, my family in Ireland, my colleagues, anytime I wanted to. I would have Skype. My son recently spent six months working for a bank in Kazakhstan. And twice a week, we Skyped him. And we sat in our uh, study in uh, Berlin, and we spoke to our son in his apartment in Kazakhstan. So that's what I mean by globalization. The world was different 25 years ago. Because when you went to a foreign country, you really felt like you were abroad. <laughs> you really felt like you were in a foreign country. In India in those days, there were no imported products. Everything was locally produced, which may have been a good thing, may have been a bad thing. I make no judgment call on that. What I'm saying to you is that today you go to India and everything is there. Is there anybody Chinese here today? No? Yes. Well, when I first went to China in 19. 81. I was doing a round the world trip from, from Delhi. I went via uh, Britain and then the US and then eventually China and then back to Delhi. And in those days in China, 1981, most people still wore the old costume, the old Mao suit, right? And when you walk down the street in Beijing, People looked at you because you were a strange foreign person that looked so different from the rest of the people around. I was in Beijing a few years ago, and it's now full of all the international... Um, I was in Shanghai, and it was uh, some parts of Shanghai were like... It um, could have been Paris, could have been London, could have been Dublin, could have been Berlin, with all the Starbucks and Pizza Hut and all these kind of... Uh, these things didn't exist in... Uh, 1981 in, in China. So the point I'm making to you is that the world now is very much connected through the internet and through the fact that trade has become far easier and you can essentially buy the same things in Shanghai as you can in, in Berlin, as you can in Dublin, as you can in New Delhi. And that wasn't the case uh, 30 years ago, even 20 years ago. So does that mean, because you buy the same thing in Shanghai and Dublin and Berlin, does that mean that we're all the same now because we all have the internet, we all have um, the same products, we all you know, dress alike? And the answer I would give is it doesn't, because national identity is still extremely important. To most people, now there are people, of course, who will say, no, I don't feel I have a national identity. I believe I'm, I'm, I'm above that. I'm a European or I'm an international person. But they are a tiny minority. For most people, their identity comes from their locality. So you may be a Berliner or you may be a, a person from my home county of Waterford in the southeast of Ireland. Or you may be from some part of you know, the southern states of the U.S., where you have a very distinctive sense of being a, a Texan or a, or a, um, or, or from Alabama or South Carolina or somewhere like that, or, 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 or in the case of my wife, she's Australian, but she's Western Australian. She's from the Western part of Australia, and her identity is really a West Australian identity. Of course, she's Australian as well. But by and large, for most countries, particularly smaller countries like Ireland, 
national identity is still a very important thing. And the question is, the big question for all of our societies is, how do you combine the reality of a globalized community, of the world being connected in the way it is through the internet and so on, how do you combine that with a national identity? And that's a, that, that's a big question. Now, I think that during the years 1994 to 2008, when the Irish economy went through this extraordinary boom, we, our economy grew by an average of 7% a year. Now, China can do that because it's got 1.4 billion people, but for a country with 4.5 million people, growing your economy at that rate is, is a sort of a, it's a da not dangerous, but it's certainly, it's not, a, it's not something that, that is easy to do because you, 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 know, you risk seriously overheating your economy, which is what happened with us, and that's why we're having such difficulties at the moment. So, during that time, I think, to some extent, we in Ireland perhaps believe that globalization and economic advancement was really the only, the only show in town. In other words, I'm not saying we lost our identity, but there was certainly a risk during those boom years that we were so carried away with the success of our economy. I mean, every year, the economy grew by 6 7%. Every year, unemployment went down. People's salaries went up. People could go on three, four holidays a year. They could buy nice, big German cars. So to some extent, our problems that we've had since 2008 are maybe a reflection of the fact that during the boom years, we kind of forgot the facts of economic life, which are that you can only be wealthy when you create and produce things that other people want to buy, and you produce them at a price that other people are willing to pay. And all economies risk pricing themselves out of the market by getting too much preoccupied with more and more growth, more and more higher and higher salaries, more and more consumption, and then eventually you have a crunch comes, and very often that's when you have an economic downturn. So I think it's true that we, in a way, for part of that period between 1992 and 2008, so a 15-, 16-year period when the economy was booming, perhaps we started a little bit to forget who we are. That we're a small country, we have limited population, limited market, therefore the only solution for Ireland is to be open to the world and to produce things at a competitive rate that other people want to buy at prices they can afford. So what's happened in the last couple of years? Well, obviously our society, our economy, our system has undergone a seismic shock. We were hit by an economic earthquake. That when your economy declines by 9% in one year, that's an economic earthquake. And no society can just shrug its shoulders at that kind of impact because the effect of it was that we went from 2007, say, our economy grew by, say, 5%. 2009, it, it, went, it, it declined by 9%. And unemployment in 2006 was about 4%. By 2010, unemployment had risen to 14%. In 2005 and 6, we were importing people in vast quantities. We had huge numbers of Poles, Lithuanians, Latvians, Slovaks, Czechs, and so forth, came in when the European Union was enlarged in 2004. The first place these people wanted to go was to Ireland. 
because that's where the jobs were available. That's where the salaries were highest. So the shock of the last three years has been very considerable. So today, now that we've had this terrible economic earthquake, who are we today? And the answer is that we're a people whom I think have learned a lesson from the economic crisis. Now, of course, at the moment, many people in Ireland are still angry and disenchanted. They feel that the bankers and the financial speculators made huge profits during the boom years and that when the crash came, the bill was transferred to the taxpayer. That the Irish government ended up guaranteeing the banks and bearing the weight of the losses sustained by the banks during the boom period or during the crash period. So they gambled. When they won, they got the profits. And when the gamble went wrong, the taxpayer ended up taking the hit. Now that's a caricature, it's a, a simplification, but it's the way many people in Ireland now view the situation in which we find ourselves. So who are we today? Well, we, I think, I think there's a, there is a, a national consensus that we need to get ourselves out of this economic situation that we find ourselves in as quickly as possible. So there's a determination to, we don't like the idea that in 2009 we had to, sorry, 2010, we, we had to rely on the, on the EU and the IMF to provide a rescue package for the Irish economy. We don't like that. We are, we are determined to remove ourselves from that rescue package as soon as possible and to go back to being a normal country borrowing on the international markets in the normal way without having to get support from the EU and the IMF. So who do we think we are? I think we, as I said to you earlier, we think of ourselves as a country with two cultures coming together. In other words, the, the English language generated cultural world. We recognize ourselves to be part of that. And if you go to any bookshop in any airport in the world where you have a selection of English language books, you will find many Irish writers represented there. So we're part of that world. But as I said, we're, we, you know, we also have our own traditional culture. And we like to think of ourselves as combining those two cultures into a single cultural offering that is different from other English-speaking countries who don't have this additional cultural influence operating on them. Who do others think we are? Well, you know, the way others think of you changes all the time. To some extent, we ourselves, our view of ourselves evolves slowly and we hardly even know we have a view of ourselves. I mean, you don't get up in the morning and say, who am I? No, nobody does that. But over time, identity does change and evolve, and that's a good thing, because it would be terrible if we were all stuck in a, in, in a mold that couldn't be changed. Because I've seen the changes that occurred in China, for example, over the last 30 years. You know, I mean, it's a fantastic country. It's a different country now than the one I visited in 1981. And I would say, for most people, it's a far more interesting and better country now than it was then. I mean, there may be people who have a nostalgia for the old days and so on, that's fine. But I would say, you know, the changes have been good. Um, India, I was back there maybe 10 years ago, and I could see the country had changed as well. And by and large, uh, the changes have been positive. There were some negatives as well. So it would be terrible if we all remained in the single mole that we were created in and couldn't change. So we have to change. But others um, sometimes have a view of you that gets 
there's a mold. It's a stereotype. And, and I guess the Irish stereotype is the stereotype of the American, the Irish Americans. There are 40 million people in the United States of Irish descent. And over the years, over the decades, we had so many films, old films, that showed Ireland as this kind of rural uh, place populated by interesting, charming, but rather sort of, um, rather, you know, poor and misfortunate people in a way, you know? So, for example, you won't have heard of this film, but if you, if you study film history, you know, The Quiet Man with John Wayne and Maureen O'Hara, this kind of image of a, of a rural, backward sort of country, which, of course, no longer exists, but it's still what Americans think of as Ireland. And, for example, next week, we will have the biggest and the most successful national branding operation on this planet, St. Patrick's Day. Now, I always ask the question, apart from your own national day, the American national day, which most people know to be the 4th of July, and Bastille Day, which is France's national day, how many other national days have any profile outside the country celebrating its national day? And the answer is very, very few. But St. Patrick's Day is one of the few national days that actually is celebrated by people other than Irish people. And if you go to any pub here in Berlin, any Irish pub next week on St. Patrick's Day, there'll be a big party. And people from all over the place will be, will be drinking Guinness and in some way celebrating St. Patrick's Day. And for example, Fifth Avenue next week will be closed for St. Patrick's Day. And the St. Patrick's Day parade will go down that, that street for three hours. Uh, a huge Irish cultural event, but it's a reflection of the fact that the Irish have been an emigrant people, and in the United States in particular, they established a very powerful position for themselves, and now they celebrate St. Patrick's Day with great, great splendor. And in fact, the St. Patrick's Day parade in New York is much bigger than the one in Dublin. And in fact, the one in Dublin has developed over the last 20 years because it has to now match the St. Patrick's Day parade in the, in the US. Because previously, when American tourists came to Ireland for St. Patrick's Day, they were very disappointed to see this rather limited parade with people in uniforms marching up and down. Now it's great fun. Now it's well worth going to Ireland for St. Patrick's Day because the St. Patrick's Day parade is now a street party, more or less, and it's, it's, it's almost like Carnival in Rio. It's, it's that kind of thing, right? But that's because we've had to match what the Americans were doing. The river that flows through Chicago is turned green for St. Patrick's Day. And let me just let you in on a secret. The last couple of years, the Irish Tourist Board, Tourism Ireland, and Irish embassies around the world have been greening iconic buildings for St. Patrick's Day. So last year, the Empire State Building turned green in New York. Sydney Opera House turned green. Table Mountain in South Africa turned green. The Moulin Rouge became the Moulin Vert in Paris. And this year, let me tell you exclusively, that Niagara Falls will be turning green for St. Patrick's Day. But more importantly, people living in Berlin, the Telecom Tower in Alexanderplatz will be going green for St. Patrick's Day. And that's an example of nation branding that you can't buy. Because who, could, who would get permission to run what's, it's not a national ad, but to, 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 to run something, to, to put up your, 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 your corporate logo on, on um, Niagara Falls or the Empire State Building, how much would you be charged for that, for goodness sakes? You couldn't, nobody could afford it. Green, obviously, is not our corporate national logo, but it's, a, but it's a color identified with Ireland. And therefore, the fact that we have this capacity to, to green all these iconic buildings around the world is an example, I think, of the influence that the Irish emigration to these countries has had on attitudes to Ireland. So, so St. Patrick's Day is a very good example of, of who other people think we are, because if, 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 if people in Germany 
and let's talk about Germany for a moment. People in Germany think about Ireland. What do they think about? They think about Irish pubs. So they think the Irish are happy-go-lucky, jolly people who are all the time drinking Guinness and singing in the pubs. And that's great for tourism because that's why Germans go to Ireland. And more than 400,000 Germans went to Ireland last year. It's our third biggest tourism market. Of course, we would prefer Germans to think of Ireland as a sophisticated, modern economy, which we are. We would prefer to think them to think of Ireland as a country that produces, um, that has nine of the ten biggest software companies operate in Ireland. We would like to think of them as the European home of Google and PayPal and LinkedIn and Facebook, all of which have their European headquarters in Ireland. We would like, to think, we'd like them to think of Ireland as a country that uh, is the second biggest producer of software in the world. We would like to think of them as a country that has nine of the top ten international pharmaceutical companies based in Ireland. But the image of Ireland that, that we would like people outside to have is different from the one that they have. Because when I meet Germans and I tell them that our exports to Germany last year were 7 billion euros, right? It's a big quantity of exports. They always say, oh, that must be Kerrygold butter, is it? <laughs> now, Kerrygold butter is a big export item from Ireland to Germany. But it's only, it's probably 1% of our total exports. So, for Germans, Ireland's identified with Irish pubs, Kerrygold, um, maybe the Dubliners uh, folk group. You know, there are certain images that people have which are different from the ones that, that we would like to present ourselves or that we would think of ourselves. We think of ourselves differently from the way Germans or Americans think of us. But the key thing is that I think you have to accept the stereotypes and try to modify them slightly. You cannot say to Germans, no, forget about pubs, don't worry about pubs, it's not a big thing in Ireland, because you will kill their interest in Ireland. What you've got to say is, yeah, pubs, we have pubs, but we also have amazing universities, and we also have, it's, it's a great place to go to learn English. So in other words, you have to accept the given image that you have and try to modify and develop that image. There's no point in, in, in us telling Americans that Ireland is totally different from the Ireland of the leprechauns and all of that that they read about in their, in their fairy tale books at school or, or that they saw in various films over the years. What you have to say is, yes, that's part of our tradition, but there's also a modern, dynamic, vibrant Ireland. So it's a case of accepting what's there and trying to modify it rather than trying to say to people, no, you're wrong. That's, not this, that's completely wrong about Ireland. You need to say, yeah, you, you got part of the story there. The green island, the place where people are happy and like the atmosphere in the pubs and play good music, that's true. But there's another dimension to it. So in other words, cultural diplomacy, I think, is modifying received images rather than scrapping them. So I think I might just stop there and I'll just finish by by saying um, two things. First of all, when it comes to developing our national brand, we have realized that our, the Irish communities around the world are a very significant source of influence and impact. So for example, Last year, Barack Obama came to Ireland to pay a visit to our country. Now, why did he come to Ireland? Well, partly it was because he has a great, great, great grandfather who emigrated from the Midlands of Ireland in the 19th century. So he wanted to visit his ancestral homeland. But the second reason is undoubtedly because there are 40 million Irish Americans 
all of whom have votes, most of whom have votes in the, the coming presidential election. So clearly, I, I think I, I saw a figure there recently that, that more American presidents have visited Ireland in the last century than visited Russia or the Soviet Union as it was. So, you know, we've had a, a significant uh, number of Irish, of American presidents coming to Ireland, most of whom can claim some kind of Irish link, however far back in history it may be. So we've, we've, we've discovered that the, the Irish communities abroad give Ireland a bigger footprint than it would have if we were just this island of six million people, right? Second thing is that we recently had a, had a gathering of people of Irish descent, prominent people from all over the world who came to Ireland to advise the government on how to get ourselves out of the current economic crisis. And these were mainly hard-nosed business people. And what was the message they gave us? The message they gave us was, your culture is your unique selling point. Don't be too preoccupied by the fact that you can make things, that you produce software and chemicals and pharmaceuticals and medical technology and so forth. What makes you, any country can do that. What makes you unique is your cultural vibrancy. Because as I always say, success for countries in the 21st century will depend not on being able to make things, but on being able to make things up. In other words, it will be creativity that will be more important than production capacity. And next year, we're actually having what we call a gathering. The government has decided that we're going to have a year, and we're going to call it the gathering. And this is to encourage people of Irish descent to come back to Ireland, but also to encourage friends of Ireland, Germans who have houses in Ireland, to encourage their friends to visit Ireland. So we're using our international diaspora to benefit our country at a time of economic difficulty. And my final point is that it's a question, really. In the current climate, when we're, our economy is, is, is coming around, we have good prospects for the future because we have a young, well-educated, English-speaking population, which is a big asset in the contemporary economic environment. But is our identity changing and evolving? And will this crisis actually have a seismic effect on Irish attitudes? I think it will, because I think that a hard lesson has been learned in the last five years. And the lesson is that you can never become complacent as a small country. You, you've got to work at it all the time. You've got to continue to reinvent yourself economically if you're to cope with new challenges and changed economic circumstances. And I think that there's now an understanding in Ireland that our future is not guaranteed. We have to work for it, and we're determined to do so. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to answer questions on any subject. Any reasonable subject. <laughs> Thank you very much, Your Excellency, for a very thought-provoking lecture.